Hello everyone, I hope you're all keeping well wherever you might be joining us from today. Uh, today, Anastasia Hatsivasilou, CEO of Super Able Mind and the SAM Method, joins our founder Justin Stead to talk about the social dilemma, the problems we're facing and stoic solutions. Um, feel free to type any questions or comments through the Q&A or the chat functions at any time. Um, and please also check out our social channels for upcoming webinars and foundation activities were on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's discussion and now I'll hand over to Justin, founder of the foundation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Holly, for that introduction. This is a very interesting topic that we're going to discuss this afternoon. And I'm very pleased to have Anastasia with us this afternoon. And we'll talk more about uh, Anastasia in a moment. Uh, but it's a very hot topic at the moment as well. Um, a lot of positivity in social media, but also there is some major concerns that are coming through in society about the platforms, potential manipulation, the money-making uh, model, the algorithm, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm very privileged to have Anastasia with, uh, with, us, with me this afternoon to chat about uh, the whole concept of social media and its impact. And why it's important for the foundation is that, you know, literally 12 months ago, we're coming up in our first 12 month anniversary and we laid out at our event in London, which I was very pleased that Anastasia joined us for that inaugural event. When we laid out the vision of the foundation, all things stoic, as you can see on this slide on the left, uh, the engagement with the business community and business leaders to be thinking more along the lines of stoic philosophy and how they create strategy, uh, interact, with teams and how they build their ESG strategy and how they bring stoic thought into business engagement. But the third piece of the foundation, which we're very passionate about is youth and bringing the awareness of stoicism to a younger audience earlier in life. And, you know, often um, you'll hear various people talk about it within the stoic community. People come across stoicism later in life and they come at, whether it's a tragedy or the wheels have come off, they're facing some sort of, um, you know, um, adversity and stoicism seems to come to people in those circumstances. But whether uh, that's the case with the youth awareness of stoicism and how it can help them on a day-to-day -day basis at a younger age is really important to the foundation. And there's a lot of strategy that we're gonna to put together to try and attract youth in, an, in a uh, more meaningful way. On this particular topic of the social dilemma and social media, uh, it's really relevant for the younger generations coming through and the effects both positive and negative of social media. So as, as, uh, as mentioned, we're delighted to have Anastasia with us this afternoon. Uh, she's a SAM neuro practitioner with a BA uh, diploma in behavioral analyst. She has 30 years of practical experience and studies in areas of behavioral psychology, neuropsychology, and evolutionary biology, among other areas of human behavior. And she's a terrific expert in these areas. Since 2013, she's helped more than 250 people and have more than 5,000 hours of clinical experience. Most of them children, which is very interesting, and teenagers and parents teaching and coach them how to meaningfully connect and effectively communicate. And obviously with the the growth of social platforms, people like Anastasia have a very unique perspective of working with youth in this new environment. So the social dilemma itself, well, the Netflix series that, you know, took, uh, that came to all of us and many people have seen it and it's generated a lot of discussion. Uh, a lot of it, you know, uh, has been positive in terms of getting the debate out in front uh, front and center of society. And some of the negativity that's coming from it is of something of real concern. So the social dilemma that we're gonna to discuss today and then have some stoic thought around how you manage social media interaction is really the core of today's discussion. So I'm gonna hand over to initially with Anastasia commenting, you know, what do we really have here? What is really happening within this social dil dilemma and the interaction of all of us, but particularly young people, and some of the things, challenges, opportunities that we're all kind of encountering. Now, for full disclosure, 
I myself have to admit that I don't do social media. I do social media through the foundation uh, because we feel like that's a powerful medium to work. And I do social media through my business engagement on a personal level. I have just decided that for me and the way I like to live that I personally don't participate. So I thought that would be very important uh, to disclose that up front. Uh, my wife is a big social media and she engages in it quite extensively. Uh, all my friends do and, and to a last week, I don't. But that's just for disclosure. So Anastasia, welcome this afternoon. And we'd love to hear your opening comments about the social dilemma and how you see it. Um, thank you, Justin. Uh, and thank you for disclosing the truth. Um, I think we go through waves of our use of, of, of the internet and social media, but um, I certainly have. But ever since reading The Distracted Mind by, um, by Jonathan, no, by Gazelli and Rosen, um, I kind of took out an experiment and to see, you know, how would I feel if I changed the way that I use the internet and social media? So the way that I use it is my, I only have 30 minutes of social media allowance a day. I only post on Instagram maybe once a week. I don't go onto Facebook. Um, my phone switches off at 10 in the evening and doesn't switch back on until 7 a.m. I don't turn the phone on until five minutes before my first client. Um, I, when I'm sitting to watch a movie, I don't answer text or messages or emails. I just immerse myself in the movie. I have the policy, one thought at a time, one person at a time, one project at a time. Um, and that takes me away from multitasking, switch tasking to single tasking, which is what our brain really likes to do. Um, but to the social dilemma, you know, what do we have? You know, what, what are the challenges that we're facing, you know, currently before us? Um, I'd like to quote Dr. David Greenfield, who's from Connecticut, and he's a professor of, of clinical psychiatry, and he runs these rehabilitation clinics um, in Connecticut for uh, digital kind of addicts. And last year at the ICAD conference for addiction, he said, you know, the internet is like having, uh, you know, 24 hour access to this biggest, largest slot machine in the world, and it's located in your pocket. Mm. Um, that means I can have whatever, whenever, food, uh, uh, sex, relationships, um, you know, whatever, whenever. So in essence, it's kind of not, you know, it's, it's, it's not the, the principle of less is more, which is quite stoesque, you know, and it's more the principle of the more, the better, which is quite hedonistic. So, you know, what does this mean? You know, what, you know, what does this mean? Well, you know, there are, there are consequences to you know, whatever we do with our brain determines what happens to our brain next. In other words, you know, um, you know, how the functionality of the brain, how, you know, how we engage, how we communicate. So the social dilemma, what, you know, what's before us, you know, it's, it's actually, uh, you know, it's, it's impacting, it's affecting the very fabric, the very building blocks of our, of our relationships, our, our families, our societies, our communities, that you know, our democracies. Um, we're very much aware that you know we're not catastrophizing. There are enough of us that are becoming aware that this is really impacting the way that we're connecting and engaging and 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 communicate communicating. Number three, um, you know, the way that we're using you know the tech, the internet, you know, socially, uh, privately, uh, um, and also professionally. Is actually creating, you know, polarization in the community, but also in the family, in the society, and um, you know, and this has consequences. Now, to give you a little bit of back end, um, you know, I'd like to reference the work of, of you know, um, a, a great futurist called Alvin Toffler, and in the 1970s, he, in his book, uh, The Future Shock, he referenced two pivotal stages or waves of development. You know, number one was the, you know, the agricultural revolution, which spanned, you know, 3,000 years. Then we I'll have... ask you about that, which yeah. we lead in here. Sure. Great overview to start off and what's happening. That, that, that's the, the central question. And, and the things that you sent me before uh, preparing for this webinar, I thought were absolutely terrific. And we, we're going to share some of that later. But mm -hmm. the, the next real question is, how did we get here? What was that journey looking like? Yeah. Yeah, 
Um, so, you know, the back end is really important to understanding what is our front end currently. So the back end is, you know, 3000 years in the agricultural revolution. Then we had, you know, he identifies the second wave as, you know, the industrial revolution. And that was that spanned 300 years. Now, in those two waves, you know, humans had enough time to, to adapt. You know, the human brain had enough time to adapt and make adjustments and, and, and tweak you know, how we lived, how we engaged, how we interacted. Now, in his second book, in the third wave, Toffler identifies, you know, the, this third stage of, of critical significant development as the, um, you know, as the technological era. And this is the beginning of, you know, this is the introduction of computers and the beginning of screens, and this spans 30 years. Now, this bleeds into the information era where, we have, you know, we've become rabid foragers, you know, uh, users of data, of information, whether it be social media or pictures or news or whatever it is, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, th this is what we're, we're uh, prior to this, we were, you know, we would go out, we would hunt, we would bring back food. Now we've wired the brain to going out there and to kind of bringing back information, data. Now the squirrel will only, you know, will only leave its tree if there is more food in a nearby tree. Now, and we've become very similar to that. You know, we'll have read half a book, get onto the next book. You know, read this piece of media, get onto the next piece. We, we're not finishing kind of um, finishing projects. You know, we're switching tasks, we're multitasking. That's a consequence of the information era, which then bleeds into the five wavelets. And the most significant stage in that is actually, you know, back in 2000, happened in 2009 when Justin Rosenstein, who developed the like button with his partner, um, and what happened was we began to, to, to exchange, to connect, to communicate, you know, on a, on a large scale. So there were no longer, there was, it was no longer one-to-one. -one. It, it could now be 50 engaged in the conversation. So we began to, to socialize differently. Um, and this again has, you know, has consequences. Uh, it has mental health consequences. It has family consequences. Um, so you can see those five different, you know, wavelets. You know, four point four is virtual social communication. Four point three is no longer tied to a single location. We could go out and write a book in a coffee shop. Yeah. Um, so it well, really. I think you're, you're touching on that that whole piece where, if I look at those, those four. Uh, classifications there. When you get to the fourth one, uh, the techno, you know, from the industrial was still somewhat of a linear mm. line. But when you're getting into three and four, the linear line is being blown away. It's becoming exponential, and it's just yes. ramping up at such an incredible speed. So the processing as human beings probably is not. It's certainly not as fast as the technology that's available. The, the problem is, Justin, that it's too much too soon, which means that we haven't had enough time for this brain to evolutionary adapt to the new environment. So there's a great field called epigenetics, which now you know states that you know our cells, our brain, everything on the inside is only responding and adapting to what's given on the outside. Yeah. So what's given on the outside currently is the internet, devices, you know, kind of gaming, all of that. So you know why are we here? Well, you know, we're here because, you know, because we, we, uh, we're suffering, we're suffering. Um, why? Well, it's the way that we're engaging and we're communicating. Well, let's move on to the next slide, which is, you know, why we're here, what's happening. Uh, we're becoming distracted, disconnected and addicted. That's the problem. So we like to say that, you know, experience wise, the human brain, these experiences, the way that we're engaging and connecting and communicating and socializing is wiring the brain to addiction. Um, so, you know, there's no difference between chemical addiction and behavioral addiction, right? Because both uh, harness the same pathways in the brain that access the same circuits that lead to the nucleus accumbens, or we call it the pleasure center. So whether it's behavioral, gambling, social media, shopping, um, and whether it's chemical, sugar, now sugar is a big deal, sugar, cocaine, other drugs, both addictions harness the same pathways in the human brain that lead to the nucleus accumbens. 
So when we're engaged in these foraging addictive kind of tendencies, almost impulsive tendencies, what happens is that we have a surge in dopamine production. Uh, what does this mean? Well, we have these brain cells, these, you know, these, these nerve cells, these learning cells that, that, that you know, on the back of, a, of an idea, an impulse will, will, you know, this is physics up, up here. It's like they'll wire and fire and connect and form a connection. Now, if I've just taken a piece of chocolate cake or taken a line of cocaine or three glasses of wine or spent three hours on social media, my brain will produce a hell of a lot of dopamine. And so now what happens is, so I've taken that cake or I've taken that, that, you know, that cigarette or I've taken that, you know, social media. Now, this dopamine molecule needs to find its receptor. Now, the moment it finds its receptor, it will create a pleasure high. Now, where, I mean, pleasure is great. We're designed to have it. It's wonderful. But we're not designed to have it 24-7. We're designed yeah. to have it here and there, a little bit here, a little bit of the, there. We're motivated. It feels nice. But the nucleus accumbens, you know, we're not supposed to bludgeon it to death, in, in other words. You know, we're not yeah. supposed to, you know, tox it or kind of have it in excess. So the moment we begin to have too much of a good thing, be it sugar, be it drugs, be it gambling, be it pornography, be it social media, what happens is this lovely, clever nucleus accumbens has a, has a plan B. It says, you know something, I'm going to remove some of these receptors so you don't get a hit. Because if they get exhausted, what happens is those brain cells start to die. And, and then, that's the definition of addiction. And building, so that, that, in, yeah. building that into your, you know, your, your, your outlining here, the effect on people in general, you've outlined there very well, but then you're starting to see the effect on a younger audience. Yes you're touching on them and their parents and the health problems that are related to that. I'm just, I've got too much light coming in, Justin. I do apologize. Um, so the, the, the problem here is, so once there's too much, once there's too much dopamine in the system, then if there's, if the receptors aren't there, then we're going to have to have more cake, more social media, you know, have in order to get a hit. And then what happens is we develop tolerance and then we get addicted. Right. So what's the significance, you know, what about the teenage brain? Why are they so vulnerable and susceptible to addiction? So there's a great, you know, uh, quote by Eric Clapton, and he said, I became an addict when I was six, when I used to pour sugar over my butter on my bread, because mm -hmm. it, used to, it used to make me feel different. So all these substances, whether they're behavioral or chemical, right, they make us feel different. They make us feel nice. They give us pleasure. Now, the teenage brain is more susceptible to addiction for the following reasons. So the, there are two parts of the brain. We have the nucleus accumbens, which we've just mentioned, the pleasure center. And then we have, which is really in a symbiotic relationship to the new brain, the most evolved part of our human brain, which has 10 amazing features like, you know, impulse control, the ability to say no, and attuned communication and creativity and abstract thought and insight and empathy. So the moment we have too much dopamine and mixed with cortisol, i.e. anger, frustration, disappointment, i.e. taking away my screen, then what you have is that, you know, then the new brain goes offline. So now there's no point in talking to your teenager when you've removed the screens because you're going to have a massive disconnect. So the idea is give them air and space, let them be, put, you know, walk away and then, you know, speak to them. A little bit later there's one more thing about the teenage brain that makes them more susceptible to addiction and that's a process called myelination so myelination is a process that begins at puberty and end, ends at about the age of 25 what this means is that those wires at the end of their nerve cells are being myelinated in other words they're developing a a, a fatty sheath which protects them which makes them better conductors of information now because they're not myelinated, it makes them more prone to addiction. Yeah. And then the knock-on effect is, you know, with, with this slide, you, we're talking about here and you're outlining all of those medical problems but, uh, and, and addiction problems. But then it really comes into the home environment where you've got a breakdown of relationship. Correct. And so I think you're illustrating that, that here. The connections yeah. are different and the interactions are different. What we have, uh, you know, if we, if, 
if we're working with you know very successful highly motivated parents who work long hours um, they have huge levels of dopamine and cortisol and adrenaline in the workplace so they're not bonding kind of neurotransmitters they're kind of you know they're they're they're, they're tense they're kind of you know motivate they're kind of go getting kind of neurotransmitters so what we tend to see is a conflict between work and home environment. And we have parents who are really highly motivated and energetic at work, but come home with the same kind of energy and that filters in to the home environment. And it's not really conducive for bonding and connecting and, 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 and calming down and engaging uh, meaningfully. So there's often what we call, you know, a, 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 viol a violation boundary between work and home. But now with COVID and homeschooling and lockdown, you know, you have a complete violation of those boundaries where, you know, it's really tough for parents, you know, to kind of manage and homeschool their children. Yeah. What we tend to advise is more bonding exercises, monopoly, um, jigsaw puzzles, cooking together, going for runs together and really scheduling in time like that to share with your children and also being being more like engaging with them asking them questions um and and having face-to-face -face time with them you know i work with one family that kind of they have four stories and they have two children and each person has a story of the house you know um the idea is is to get together you know for lunches or for dinners uh, or, or walks together um, because children need these kind of bonding exercises that don't make social media so attractive. Um, I think one of the things that I'd love to get your perspective on it, watching the social dilemma, and then in addition to some of the presentations that you sent me, uh, leading again up to this webinar, and then scrolling a, a few of those books and the highlights that we'll show in a moment. What I what I found interesting that anyone that that in this, particularly in the social dilemma, the people that were at the beginning of this journey of these creations and created the engineering side of it and the architecture of these sites and the business model, you know, there's a high percentage of them that don't let their children near these sites. Correct. Which I, I found really, um, for obvious reasons, very telling of the concerns around uh, all the things you've just referenced and then building that they just don't want their kids near it because they know that you know it's, it can be highly highly negative it, it it compromises human relationships it compromises the connect but the other thing that that they're very much aware of um is that addiction often you know transfers to another addiction so once you've conditioned those pleasure centers that nucleus accumbens to pleasure then that what we often have is, you know, cross addiction. So you give up sugar, you take up, you know, maybe alcohol, you give up alcohol, you maybe take up cigarettes, you give up cigarettes, maybe you take up excessive exercise. So, you know, once you learn addiction early on and, and, and your biochemistry has, has been affected, there's a memory of that in the physicality of the body and in the physicality of the brain and in those circuits. So the developers of these, of these products are well aware of this because initially they got psychologists involved to see how they could hack the human brain and make us addicted long enough where they could seduce us into buying into different products. Um, so in essence, they were kind of seducing us with the idea of more happiness, but through more pleasure. If yeah. we want to experience more happiness, now there's a difference between dopamine, drive, 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 go, 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 achieve, 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 right? Which is good in small doses and a difference between that and serotonin. Like serotonin is more the happiness and contentment neurotransmitter. In other words, it's more us and we rather than I and me. Yeah. So, and there are great ways, we'll speak about this later on, about how you can produce more serotonin in the body. And it does literally make you feel very differently. It's a different human experience. Look, a great, great overview. So let, let's, we'll, we'll move our conversation on and start to talk through some of the thought process around management of social media through a, uh, you know, a stoic um, perspective. And I just, I think from try, from my own perspective, trying to be an aspiring stoic most days of my life and going into all sorts of situations. The first thing I always do now is I bring my stoic lens down into most things in my life. So, you know, and we start thinking about, you know, the four virtues, applying the four virtues as a stoic looking at this particular problem. So 
the first the first thing I'd say uh, from a stoic perspective is look this social dilemma the social media engagement the communities that have been created there's so much good in that and stoicism would claim that that is that is that is a good at face value uh, there's a rational engagement involved there and we are socially uh, we're social beings and therefore just because of you know the last you know 3,000 years of human engagement now we're in a highly technical um, and highly energized digital world you know those platforms still provide a social engagement we are social beings therefore it's here to stay and it's rational to engage if you decide to gay because there are benefits for ourselves and our society so i think the first thing from a stoic perspective is there's no point trying to say that it's not going to be there the, the platforms are there they're going to be there it becomes more of a uh, what i would call moving to you know epictetus is that look you know at the end of the day and i was talking to john sellers about this earlier in the week is taking his view is that you know you have to control the input, and I'd come back to the the overriding stoic um, understanding around control and the dichotomy of ha uh, of control, and also then the ability to you know create happiness really is in your own power. Now you you've laid out an excellent case of how you know there's chemical reactions and all sorts of addictive things, but you know that that is there, and they they have to be treated in a certain way. But a stoic, a stoic perspective would say, look, you know, your happiness still comes down to your, a lot of your own choice. So that's your will, the ideas concerning the events which you're involved in, or in social media's case, the events that come to you, and then your use of uh, those ideas or those interpretations or those perspectives. But your initial comment about stoicism in, in your work, Anastasia, just a general view before we go into our next, our next slide. It, you know, it's uh, if I'm, I work with, with this generation a lot and, um, you know, I could talk stoicism to them, but if they're already addicted, you know, addiction is a serious thing. If they're already addicted and they want to hold on to their pleasure and they will because they're young and, and their brain is not fully formed and they don't have impulse control, then, then you know, my tact will have to be different. You yeah. know, my view is that we have to take responsibility, the elders, you know, for, you know, for the young, for this generation by regulating, you know, we don't allow them to have alcohol until a certain age because it has an addictive impact on the brain. So why would we not, why would we not regulate in parliament? You know, for example, I think it's absolutely ridiculous that Instagram, they can, you know, there are 13 year olds on Instagram. For example, I think the age is 16, but any 13 year old or 12 year old can get on there if they wanted to, and if they had parental approval. Yeah. Um, the same with with TikTok. What we need to be aware of, you know, in terms of this, you know, kind of protection and regulation, is that there are very very sinister bodies, and I know this because the teenagers tell me this in confidence, right? That are selling drugs through TikTok, that are selling drugs through Instagram, that are there there are you know very sinister minded, you know adult people who are trying to find young people through through gaming, um, uh, through games like uh, Fortnite. You know, so in other words, they go on Fortnite, for example, it's a gaming um, uh, device and they'll pretend that they're, you know, 12, 13, and then they say, I'm running out of skins, you know, and then the child will say, well, look, I'll just get my mother's, you know, credit card number and I'll buy you some skins. Yeah. Right. So there's so much that's happening behind closed doors that as parents you'd want to be aware of, and then you'd want your parliament and your politicians to begin a process of regulation for the safety of the generation. So a clear a clear takeaway, uh, you know, from a parent's perspective here, you know, putting a stoic lens over it is this controlling of the input. What you know, if we if we're looking at what do we control, there's only two things: our actions, our judgments. The Stoics then, or a Stoic parent, would be trying to control that input to make sure that when is it suitable for a child who's coming through in the teenage years, what they should be on, what access they they uh, are allowed, and then also that interpretation. But you know, as you say, once they once the genie is out of the bottle, and it's it's a free for all then from a child's or a teenager's perspective, it's very difficult to manage. 
because it's difficult to control. So the Stoics would say, at least from a child's perspective, that you know, controlling the input, that filter, but even as an older adult, you start to get into outside of addictive or chemical addiction, you know, just good value sense around yeah. how much am I going to let this into my world? I've got to, I, as a Stoic, I have control here. Yes. Uh, and also for parents to lead by example, uh, uh, Justin. So, for example, when a parent says, oh, but this is work related and this is why I'm using my phone, that's a sense of injustice for the child. So if, if the parents can create, you know, circumstances and conditions, boundaries, which are adhered to by the adults, you know, and uh, then, then the child is more inclined to say, okay, you know, this is fair, mum and dad. Um, but parents must lead by example. There might be rules like, you know, if you want to use your phone, there's the room in there. Um, or we put our phones, you know, in a glass uh, bowl when we're at dinner or when we're at breakfast. So it's up to the, the adults to kind of create boundaries or set boundaries that are just and fair and doable. I would, you know, the, the, I, the, the rule is that anything more than two hours of screen time a day does have an impact on the mental health. Uh, of of the young person um, yeah. yeah okay so the first one is controlling the input whether it's to yourself uh in, in a certain engagement with social media but then certainly from a parent's perspective uh managing that the other thing the next point i wanted to address from a stoic's perspective is the value proposition mm -hmm. and i love this quote from donald robinson who where he talks about for stoics external things are not good or bad in the strongest sense they don't make our souls better or worse or affect our fulfillment in life. What matters ultimately is how we what, what use we make of them, good or bad, virtuous or vicious. And I think that's one of the very interesting things about social media. And I see it through our business platforms. And again, I don't use it personally, but you know, it's the interpretation and the value of social media and how people interpret that value and how they engage with the platforms and what they take from that. And I think that from a stoic perspective, again, is the ability to stand back, almost take a view from above and say, what value is here? Mm. And, you know, how am I assessing that? I was taking some points for myself, the ability to step back, uh, challenging the written word, or, or in this case, the, the digital content. Uh, you know, you don't read, you don't believe everything you read. Uh, and you've seen you've seen a lot of things happen because people will read something or take some theory or conspiracy theory and they'll run with it. Mm -hmm. So the reappraising of the value of social media, I think is, is, is a point that seems to be missing, but the stoic would say, okay, what is the value proposition here? Sure. Sure. Um, again, you know, social media and the internet, um, you know, there are many great things that have happened as a consequence, you know, saving lives, you know, uh, organ donations, et cetera, et cetera. You know, finding DNA matches that save lives. There's so many wonderful things about the internet and it does connect us and keep us connected. I mean, my family's in Australia. Um, in fact, I used to engage with them on Facebook. I don't anymore. I do it on, face on FaceTime or Zoom. Um, but, you know, we just have to assess what the circumstances are before us. You know, with the rational measured mind, be flexible and adaptable, which is one of the things that we teach uh, in the knowledge you know, flexibility supports adaptability. There's another idea that says, you know, 37 blue, you know, challenges are opportunities. You know, resilience was cultivated on the back of adversity or it's the pressure that creates the opportunity and the ability. So we wanna engage in this environment, engage in these circumstances and work together to come up, you know, to, in order to keep, you know, the, the, the good things, but also to attend to the deficits. How we attend to the deficits is for me key you know, good parenting first, you know, cr creating meaningful connections between children and parents, sustaining that, um, then good regulating, of course, just to keep, you know, to kind of do our best in this situation. Yeah, um, yeah. No, very good. The third historic perspective around social media, uh, time management. Uh, Seneca says it best, you know, it's not that we, that we have little, too little time, it's more about that we waste so much of it. And I, one of the things I do here, um, observing it in certain uh, quarters, if you will, is that there's a lot of time spent in this medium. And it, you've, you've touched on it because of the addictive nature of it. But, you know, the time, and I, I was quite 
found it quite interesting what you said up front, even in your in your own experience, that you cap yourself a, a daily limit around your exposure to social media and how you're managing your technology in your life. And, and as we all know, that Stoics would not uh, agree with any, you know, the Stoic value of temperance and moderation. Mm. One of the things, because of the addictive nature of social media, that it just seems to get away yeah. and people, you know, their life becomes, the, the living environment moves from reality to, to long stretches of time in this, this digital world. Mm. So the time management, and, and that comes back to time management. And, and, you know, what is the, if we build on this, you know, the mm. value proposition and then the amount of time that I'm spending managing it. So a t stoic perspective would be to be challenging, mm. is the allocation of time sensible mm. here? And, and yeah. it's interesting that you, you do cap yourself. You, you, you have a window of what you manage on a daily basis. It's only because I realized at one point and, you know, sometimes I would have six sessions or clients a day and my heart would be racing because, you know, talking for the long periods of time, I get tired of my own voice and it, it's very energetic and intense work. And sometimes I'm, you know, my heart's racing and, and, and it's becoming a bit intense. And then in between clients checking in on email, responding to a client on WhatsApp or, or messaging. And I thought, no, I don't like this. I'm, I'm not enjoying this. I want to go back to what I teach, which is, you know, all the time in the world. I don't want to fill my time and space. I don't want to stand in a queue and pick up my phone and fill that, that space, three minutes, whatever it is, by with something. I want to stand in the queue and just be present and watch and observe and bring the, bring the energy back into my body. So one of the things that we teach is all the time in the world, you yeah. know, and, and why we teach, you know, one thing at a time. Um, Again, it's, it's, it, it's changing, for me, it's about changing the perception of this device because we need to change the way that we see it. So our number 40 blue says perception is all there is every reality. In knowing that the, the, the phone was compromising my quality time with myself, you know, the way that I, that I was outside of my client time because um, I was racing and pacing, I thought, no, no, I've got to return to all the time in the world, one phone at a time, one person at a time. Um, so I think we have, and so I now see the phone as not a, a reward. I see it as a threat to my consciousness, a threat to my relationships. Um, now, my partner uses it differently from, from, from me, um, but I don't ask him to use it like I do. You know, I'm tolerant of that. You know, it has to be his choice, but he's an adult. If it was my, if it was, you know, my child, then, then I would be communicating differently because it, it would be my child. Yeah. Um, I think we have to be very careful and not to be judgmental of others uh, because then it creates conflict between us and others. If we're going to enhance the quality of our, of our human connection, then we, then we have to be less judgmental, more open-minded and more tolerant, more willing, but also continue to have conversations. Yeah. The, the fourth point here from, a, again, a stoic engagement into this world is that reflection and journaling and whether it's Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius or Seneca, uh, they all had different roles from different perspectives, but they all journaled and reflected on a daily basis. And one of the things that come back to time management as well is that with so much social media and tech engagement uh, going on, it does diminish the opportunity, not necessarily journaling, but it does diminish the time of self-reflection to go inside the inner citadel and think about life and so, and you know, I'd love to get your thoughts on the sense that in the social media world, you uh, people are posting their content. They're journaling and, online. They're, yeah, they're, and it's coming yeah. at them. So you're absorbing so much mm. and your time, mm. but the ability to stand back and reflect on your life and what the meaning of the value of it, the time mm. allocation to it, but then your own your own internal growth is being challenged because you know you're never powering down. Correct. Yeah. So there's a, the, what happens, you know, journaling, I've been doing it since the age of 13. Um, and I still do it every morning. I wake up at 5.30 without an alarm clock. And the first thing I do is I make my tea and then I go to my journal and I, and I choose a subject. And it could be one thought at a time or making amends with myself or I just pick a subject random. And then I sit there and I reflect. Now, the beauty of picking up a pen and, and, and putting it on a piece of paper is that it activates the reticular system of the brain. And as a consequence of this, now we're accessing those 10 amazing features of, of the new brain or what I call the baby genius. 
So those 10 features are insight, mental time travel, the ability to, to reflect on the past and perhaps to project onto a future. You know, so in the morning I kind of, I, I access, you know, I access my consciousness or I create a level of consciousness or I, or I set a rhythm, a gentle, calm, slow rhythm. Then I, I, I zen for, for 20 minutes. So I sit on my cushion and I just, you know, I focus on my breath and on my posture. And I think about things like, um, you know, uh, control or, you know, just little Zen principles. And then when I, when I get up, my intention is to walk in the way that I felt in that, in that practice. So for me, journaling is imperative because it enables us to access those 10 features of the middle prefrontal cortex. Yeah. Um, I think that's very powerful. One of the most important things in the Stoics um, is that reflection period, journaling, uh, as mentioned here, all of the major Stoics, you know, did it and advocate it. There is something, I like what you said, there is something very, very powerful about reflection. But once you pick up the pen and you write, mm -hmm. it, it's almost like it's imprinting somewhere else, not just on the written mm -hmm. paper in front of you. Um, and I think that's a really powerful part that social media, that combination, one, the time factor, but two, uh, how the content that you're raising uh, into a social media environment versus the content that you could be raising within yourself. Just to add, Justin, when you get up in the morning and quickly put your track suit on and, and, and go to the pavement and pound for 20 minutes, now you're generating dopamine, right? Now, if you get up in the morning and you pick up your pen, now you're, now you're creating, you know, you've got serotonin running in your system. Now, you know, how do you want to start your day? Well, gently, you know, with, with a rational, calm mind so that I can be my best in that environment, um, if that makes sense. Look, terrific. We're, we're amazingly, we could go on for hours, but amazingly, we're, we're almost uh, at time. I've got a, a number of questions that have come through. We've only got a few more minutes, but we'll try and get these through. And then I think we've got a hand raised as well with someone that you know. So I think Holly is going to allow someone to, to who we all know is going to jump on a quick uh, sure. question here. So Holly, please let Guy in if he's, if he's available. Oh, Guy. <laughs> Hi, if you'd like to unmute and ask the question. Sorry, struggling with tech there. Can you hear me? Hi, Guy. Hi, Guy. <laughs> nice yeah, to see you. And you, and you, listen, I don't want to take up too much of these residual seconds. In actual fact, it wasn't a question. It was more a comment. I was just, I just wanted to um, in, endorse your work because, because obviously, um, you know, through my son, Sam, I've seen um, what it is that, that you uh, do and, and, you know, the remarkable sort of, um, impact you, you know you can have in you know in terms of um, unlocking his capabilities, um, helping him um, you know use his time and 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 you know and develop. So yeah, I just wanted to say hi, and um, I thought that was I thought it was terrific. Well, usually I'd be seeing your son at this time, guy. <laughs> That's true. I forgot about that. <laughs> guy, thank, thanks for, for thanks, adding guy. that in. That's awesome uh, and, and great validation for the work that Anastasia does. Anastasia, we've got a couple of minutes left, but I just wanna, there's a couple of questions that have come through. One from Kerry that says the following, does the panel believe in if we taught stoicism as, as part of the school curriculum, it would help our children and young adults better deal with the social dilemma? If so, how do you achieve this? So stoicism in, at, at a younger audience, I think we, we think, but your mm. quick comment on that, Anastasia? Well, I mean, as I said, the reason why Pat Cash invited me to the Aurelius Foundation was because he did the course and the ideas that I teach, he thought they were very stoic. So my work in the last eight years has been working with lots of young people in boarding schools or state schools. Um, and I teach them the ideas of what I call the rainbow knowledge. Um, and so the ideas that I teach are, you know, responding versus reacting, non-judgment, uh, cool, calm and connected. Um, you need to visualize to materialize my thoughts, my choices, my emotions, my consequences. So in essence, when I spend time with children and we rewire the brain to these specific ideas, we are literally creating neural networks, pathways that, that then the, the child will, you know, involuntarily apply to its own environment with its peer group, with its parents uh, and, its, and its challenging moments. So stoicism, um, absolutely, I, you know, yeah a big fan of teaching these ideas uh, to young children, to teenagers and to adults. Yeah. 
And then there's one more question that I, we only have time for. There's more here, but we'll only have time for one more and then we'll close out very, very efficiently. Uh, it's from David. It says, many years ago, my parents were beside themselves at the amount of TV we watched. When we moved from three channels to, to having four channels, which is fascinating, the debate raged about the situation being out of control. Uh, David then says, aren't we simply seeing the same again? And what of the future? And you've touched on a lot of that in your comment. Okay. I'm going to use... I'm going to use my personal experience um, and I'm 55 in April, but when I was young and I was an athlete, I wasn't an academic. I became an academic later on um, when, when there was pressure put upon me by my father, but I was heavily addicted to watching after school, straight to the television, get smart, I dream of Jeannie, Gilligan's Island. And I was absolutely addicted. My mum and dad would come home at 6 PM and they'd say, have you done your homework? And I'd say, yes, mum. So what I learned very early on, what I didn't learn was the principle of delayed gratification. And that became my, you know, my involuntary kind of, you know, response. So um, I was addicted to television. And, it, you know, if I could say, you know, in the past 30, you know, 33 decades, I have crossed addicted to other things like excessive work or excessive exercise um, for that dopamine hit. So yeah, I have been a dopamine junkie. Is television the same? Does it have the same effect as social media? It's different because it's a different kind of engagement. Um, so with television, it was one-on-one. -on -one. It was your time with the television or is social media and that, and that big dark, you know, um, web offers different, you know, different things for young people. So, and because it offers so many different things and it exposes them at a very young age to influences which can be detrimental. Well, great summary. Um, look, I wish we had more time. Uh, it's a fascinating subject. We should have probably planned more time. That's my fault, but look, fantastic uh, uh, overview in a very uh, controversial subject in one way. Uh, but also the fact is in looking at these takeaways that just very, very quickly, social media is here to say as Stoics, we would embrace that medium positively as social beings. Number two is that wisdom would suggest filtering carefully what and who you allow yourself to interact with. Mm -hmm. Number three would suggest justice would, su would be suggested content mm -hmm. and how you generate the content and how you absorb it. Forward temperance would really suggest around encouraging a balance in terms of the time spent on social platforms and a review of the quality of that time spent on those platforms. Yeah. And then finally, you know, the cardinal virtue of courage would deliver the strength to control one's participation or not. And yeah. I think if we wrapped everything up from a, from a stoic perspective, there would be other, other mm -hmm. viewpoints, but I think that would, that would carry the day. Um, and as you're going to close out, these are some recommendations that you steered me towards. Anything yeah. you'd have some quick comments in here. I really liked uh, some of these topics. I went through them over the last week, some of these books and read yeah. some of the okay. outlines. Anything so, you'd pull out? First to acknowledge the lady that said, ask the question on the chat, what if your husband watches too much television? I acknowledge yeah. that. Uh, Sending no, to counseling no. with me is my advice. Um, to these books, now Lost Connections, Johan Hari, watch his TED talk, 20 minutes. The root cause of addiction is a lack of human connection. So what, what lesson is that for us? You know, really take the time to bond and to connect and to communicate, um, you know, with, with, with people, friend, you know, friends, husbands. Um, now, The Hacking of the American Mind, amazing book, amazing book. Uh, if you want to go more into the biochemistry of addiction, brainstorm Daniel Siegel. If you've got teenagers and children, he's got five, six books. I love his work to bits. Watch him on YouTube, learn a lot. Hold on to your kids, Gabor Matty, an expert on addiction. He is a phenomenal man who has great stories and great advice. The Distracted Mind is my recent baby. It's changed the way that I work. It's changed the way that I interact. Um, Gazelli and Rosen are doing amazing work uh, about this uh, on a large scale. And The Coddling of the American Mind is by, um, by Jonathan Haidt, uh, who, who has that great 50 minute uh, video that I sent you, um, yeah. Justin, which is a must, a must see. Um, and these, are great, these are great recommendations. And uh, I think as I started to explore a number of them and just trying to to get some of the essence, I think I kept coming back to uh, stoic influence and those, those key points around trying to, how would I interpret that mm. as, as 
inspiring stoic. So I thought they were great. But Anastasia, thank you so much for your time today. A brilliant overview, very interesting topic. When we do get to, together collectively uh, in our first event, which I'm hoping the first Aurelius event in person will be more towards June, July in London, not dissimilar to what we did last year, but we'd love to have you there and, and, and take some time with us as a foundation and present some of these, uh, these viewpoints further in person and, and so forth. I think it's a, it's a very important topic and the stoic application here is also very important. Just closing out very quickly because I'm conscious of time. We've got our next webinar on March 30th with Eve Riches, which is gonna be a very interesting one on stoic uh, perspectives into relationships. So I'm looking forward to having that conversation with Eve. We've got the Modern Stoicism, the Aurelius Foundation partnership with the anniversary of the 1900th birthday of Marcus Aurelius. Uh, and that's gonna be on the 20th. So there's some really interesting uh, stoic uh, uh, speakers and perspectives that'll be shared on that day. And the foundation is looking to support that in earnest. And we've had some really interesting, uh, what we call stoic weeks in business where we're engaging businesses on a five day program in stoic week engagement. Uh, we're booked out for the, We've done five and we've got uh, quite a number of engagements that are booked out really through May. So that is really building some momentum, um, which is great within the business community. And we're also building a senior management module as well for a day seminar. So, but look, that's, uh, that's it for today. Uh, absolutely delighted to spend the time. Anastasia, thank you so much. You're a great supporter of the foundation and a great supporter of, uh, of Stoicism. So. Um, really grateful and we look forward to seeing you soon and look forward to seeing everyone else soon. Thank you so much, Justin. I have to say, just a quick add, that my first personal development book when I was 21 was the, were the journals of Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I absolutely love it. So I highly recommend people to read the journals of Mike Marcus Aurelius. Yeah. yeah. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anastasia. Thanks, Holly. And we look forward to seeing everyone soon. Bye now. Bye.